major disasters occur because there's a whole string of events that happen in a certain order, any one of which, had they not happened, the disaster wouldn't have happened. So we'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tank. You figure that nothing is perfect. Everything's going to fail. Two or three failures that interact in a way that nobody anticipated bring the system down. Okay, you know, we've had a problem here. Some of our most soaring triumphs as a race, the pyramids, the Parthenon, the shining towers of a modern city. Public building can be the most impressive and memorable of engineering feats, and the most spectacular when it fails. Engineering disasters are nothing new. Over 4,000 years ago, the oldest written law book, the Code of Hammurabi from ancient Babylon, provided penalties that represented the world's first building codes. If a builder build a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house which he built fall in and kill its owner, then that builder shall be put to death. If it kill the son of the owner, the son of that builder shall be put to death. If it kill a slave of the owner, then he shall pay slave for slave to the owner of the house. If it ruin goods, he shall make compensation for all that has been ruined. In 305 BC, after a military victory, the citizens of ancient Rhodes commissioned the largest statue ever built as tribute to their protector, the god Apollo. Built of solid bronze by the sculptor Chares of Lindos, the massive monument and its base rose 150 feet above the harbor, about the same height as the modern Statue of Liberty. It took eight years to build, and when it was finished, the Colossus of Rhodes was one of the seven wonders of the world. But Chares and his engineers were only guessing at the stresses involved. In an earthquake in the second century BC, the mighty statue cracked at the knees and fell to earth. Throughout history, the curious want to know what happens when you try to build a little farther, a little lighter, a little higher than anyone else. Oftentimes the answer is disaster. In the Middle Ages, the Gothic cathedrals of France sent thin spidery spires straight up into the heavens. The citizens of Beauvais, France, wanted their cathedral to be taller and more beautiful than any that had come before. Once again, the medieval engineers were pushing the envelope, building higher than anyone else, against forces they didn't fully understand. At 157 feet, it was the highest roof in Europe at the time. But with only a spidery internal network of iron tie rods for support, the result was disaster. In 1284, the roof collapsed into the choir. After the collapse, the cathedral was rebuilt with additional heavy stone piers holding the roof up from the foundation. Though there was never enough money to complete it according to the grandiose plans, the Beauvais Cathedral has been called the Parthenon of France. Another building most famous for its engineering failure is a bell tower constructed in Italy beginning in 1174. Its foundation was so flawed it became world famous as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Today the tower is closed. Massive lead counterweights are slowing its collapse and local engineers have devised a system of cables to hold it up while they try to repair its foundation. In the next 800 years, engineering passed from an art into a science, and the achievements and failures of engineers became truly breathtaking. When the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State opened in 1940, it was thought to be lovely and elegant in the new lightweight style, but nothing very groundbreaking. It was a wonderful bridge just to look at. It was beautiful. The spectacular Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco had opened three years before, with a span almost 2,000 feet longer. 
On the other coast, New York's George Washington Bridge, built in 1933, was 700 feet longer. But the Tacoma Narrows Bridge would make a lasting name for itself. Within days of its opening, it began to sway like a hammock in the breeze. Pretty soon, it was the most famous bridge in America. We learned that about the, the bridge, that when the wind was up, it would become galloping gurdy, move up and down. And when the wind was really bad, we used to ride our bikes out there, park on a hill beside the bridge, and watch it go up and down just for a lark. They let people go when the dropping was so sudden that it felt like an old-fashioned elevator. Boom, like that. Galloping Gertie remained open to traffic for four months. But in November, everybody was ordered off as a 40-mile-an-hour gale whipped across her deck, lifting the roadway like a sail. We went out to, to watch it whip, and it was really whipping, and there was one car on it. But then it got late, and so we left. By afternoon, the stresses were too much. Incredibly, the 11,000-ton center span ripped away and crashed into the sea. Aerodynamic problems had never been considered important before. Every bridge ever designed, even the smallest um, arch over a stream, has some aerodynamic lift associated with that span, some aerodynamic characteristics. Well, if the bridge is stone and it's 20 feet long, how important are the aerodynamic forces? They're not. But the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was no stone arch over a stream. The center span was 2,800 feet long. Ironically, the major factor in the spectacular collapse was that bridge designers were getting better. Bridges were now longer, thinner, and lighter. As that trend continued, inevitably, the secondary effect of aerodynamics on a bridge one day became a primary effect. The aerodynamics are always there, but as you get longer and longer and longer, there's just more profile and your bridge is getting less proportionately stiff to length as you're getting longer and longer spans, and all of a sudden, a second-order force becomes a first-order force. After the spectacular collapse of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, other bridges with similar construction were stiffened, and they remain open to traffic today, almost 60 years later. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster forced engineers from then on to take aerodynamics into consideration when designing bridges. From bridge construction to public buildings like the Beauvais Cathedral, the buildings people use and rely on every day are still liable to fail. On the night of July 17, 1981, 1,500 people were enjoying a tea dance in the lobby of the Kansas City Hyatt Hotel. Because it was the biggest crowd to date for the new building, stresses from weight were higher than they had ever been. This animation helps explain what happened. The hotel lobby featured three walkways suspended in levels over the main floor. This is the way it was originally designed. See, the load never should have gone through this box beam. See, the original design was the load go all the way through to the ceiling. But you see what they did here. The quality of the weld here and the quality of the weld here determines whether or not this connection stays up. But good welds or not, they were never designed to carry such loads. When the rubble was cleared away, 114 people lay dead. How did construction like this slip by? Weren't there building inspectors? Roger McCarthy investigated on behalf of the architect's insurance company. Yes, this was a 600-room hotel, and the building inspection took 27 minutes. In the years following the collapse, a blizzard of lawsuits flew in every direction and two structural engineers lost their licenses. Incredible as the Hyatt collapse and the Tacoma Narrows Bridge may seem, they are just the most recent engineering disasters in public building. If history teaches anything, they won't be the last. Water, the birthplace of life, sustainer of life, ancient highway since the first ore was carved. 
Since the dawn of time, man has tried to tame the power of water, to turn it to his own purpose. Sometimes he succeeds. When he fails, it can be spectacular. As history progressed, builders of ever more complex systems and machines were discovering that the more complex the system, the more things there are to go wrong. The Titanic, I think, is one of the most classic illustrations of that. Had just any number of things, just one thing been different, the disaster wouldn't have happened. She was the biggest, the most luxurious, the most expensive. Millionaires used their influence to get tickets on her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York. Then at 11.40 p.m., the fifth day out, she struck an iceberg. 1,507 souls went down to the bottom. Yet the total area of the holes in her side were only about the size of a refrigerator. What happened to sink the unsinkable ship? The killer is when the top of the bulkhead goes below the waterline, that allows the next bulkhead in the cascade to be flooded. See, so what happens, as soon as the weight of the front pulls the top of the next bulkhead below the waterline, then the water can cascade into the following bulkheads. That's the mechanical cause of the disaster. But mystery still remains. How did the iceberg rip through the double steel hull? Not very tough steel. There's no question that the plate in the Titanic could, could not be used in a ship today. But we do see linear indications that look like the seams fail. Bad rivets or bad steel? We've pulled up a couple rivets. They don't look very good. So the rivets weren't very good, and the hull plate was not very good. The steel in the Titanic's hull was far inferior to modern steel in one crucial respect. Because of its high sulfur content, it became brittle as it got colder. That meant in the icy North Atlantic, the Titanic's hull was more prone to breaking rather than bending. And new studies indicate the three million rivets that held the ship together were made badly even by the standards of the time. Whole seams zipped open when she hit the iceberg. It's hard to imagine the most luxurious ship ever built. But underneath the gold leaf and mahogany, they used bad steel and poor rivets to hold her together. As in the triumphant Hoover Dam in Nevada, the power of water tamed can be breathtaking, unless it goes horribly wrong. Surrounded by some of the most beautiful scenery in the world in 1972, the Bureau of Reclamation began construction on the Teton Dam in Idaho, a project so ambitious they hoped it would change the scenery forever. It was a risky dam. Uh, it was built in, on risky uh, subsoil in an earthquake area, but they pushed it. Work began in 1972 after surveys were completed and plans drawn. But critics charged the Bureau of Reclamation, which built the dam, moved too quickly. They say they should have done far more preparation, that they didn't show enough respect for the power of water. They went ahead like they went ahead with the Challenger launch. We're going to get this done, we're going to do it, it's going to be a great thing. They were wrong. As the earthen dam filled to capacity, deep inside, water was eroding the subsoil foundation of the dam. And there was another problem. Piping or water seepage within the dam itself was fatally weakening the structure, making it soggy and soft. Tiny wet spots began to appear on the face of the dam as it neared capacity. They got signs that they had not sufficiently sealed the base of the dam and that it was leaking. Another warning sign, high pressure springs appeared in the earth thousands of feet downstream from the dam. On the dam face itself, the wet spots became leaks. On the morning of June 5th, 1976, more leaks developed. A government photographer took this series of pictures as the wet spots turned into small holes, then larger holes in the face of the dam. The dam was collapsing before his eyes. Then suddenly, the 500-yard thick earthen wall collapsed like a sandcastle under a wave. 
torrent washed away everything in 300 square miles. 80 billion gallons of water totally destroyed two towns and killed 11 people. The failure of the Teton Dam led to a national review of federal rules regarding dam construction and inspection. Coming up next, the kind of accidents that strike fear into the hearts of all who ride in airplanes. Aviation disasters. Mankind has a spirit that wants to rise and soar in space. Visionary engineers from Leonardo da Vinci all the way to the Wright brothers have made that dream come true. 600 million passengers now take flight every year soaring faster and higher than any bird. The first aviation disaster involved Daedalus and his son Icarus. In the Greek myth, Icarus pushed the envelope too far. When he began to approach the sun, the wax on his wings failed and he tumbled back to earth. The first important air disaster involved the hydrogen-filled Zeppelin, Hindenburg. After several round trips from Germany to the airship landing field at Lakehurst, New Jersey, on May 6, 1937, the Hindenburg arrived just after a fierce electrical storm. Camera crews were there to chronicle what happened when she dropped her mooring lines to Earth. This is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Still, it's the place. Many suspected political sabotage as the cause of the disaster, but more likely was a combination of failures, some form of electrical discharge resulting from the ship's ropes touching the ground after a thunderstorm coupled with a leak in one of the hydrogen bags that allowed the ship to float. The discharge most likely caused a spark that ignited the extremely explosive hydrogen. The entire ship was incinerated in seconds. The horrifying footage made such a deep impression around the world that after the Hindenburg, Zeppelins were completely abandoned. Yet only 36 people had died in the fiery crash. A modern airliner is a device with a million parts that pushes fragile humans to the edge of space and the edge of the sound barrier. The failure of one or two of those parts at precisely the right moment and the whole magnificent system falls to earth, often killing hundreds. One of the co-pilots came rushing back several times, back and forth, and you could look at the eyes of the stewardess and know that we were in serious trouble. Just look at their eyes. You know. Mary and Jim Call did what few people have done. They survived an airline disaster. Theirs came aboard one of the troubled early McDonnell Douglas DC-10s on a 1989 flight to Chicago. Everything seemed perfectly routine until a loud bang rocked the plane. Soon the pilot made an announcement. After um we did the big dive, and we heard the big boom. He told us that we lost the tail engine. We really weren't aware that there was a big gaping hole in the back of the plane. He said he wasn't going to kid us. It was going to be rough, very rough. He said he wasn't going to kid us. What Jim and Mary didn't know was that the number two engine in the tail had lost a fan disc. In an instant, the disintegrating fan shrapnel punctured all three of the plane's redundant hydraulic lines, causing all the hydraulic fluid to leak out and at the same time chopped off a piece of the tail. With no hydraulics, the captain had no control of the aircraft. Other aircraft use a fourth separate line in case of accidents like this. At least one passenger knew exactly what was happening. He built commercial airliners for a living. I recognized some of the noises the aircraft was making. Uh, the uh, hydraulic systems were sucking air. I just thought we're dead. No, no hydraulics, no control. 
No wing surfaces, no brakes, no nothing. For over 40 unforgettable minutes, this DC-10 carrying Bill Mackin and the calls hurtled through the sky. It almost turned over at least three times. Passengers watched in horror as the crew dumped excess fuel in preparation for a crash. Surprisingly, there was little panic on board. Some crying, some people cried, some people prayed. No, there, there wasn't was... hysterics. There was uh, some silent sobbing. Uh, people sailing, saying the Lord's Prayer, and, but not the mass hysteria that you would no, expect. No, there was not hysteria at all. People yeah. were very, very calm. Looking and at each other. A TV crew was standing by. Through an incredible piece of flying by the captain, the huge, wide body controlled only by the two outboard engines, miraculously made it to the Sioux City Airport. It came to Earth only yards short of the runway. We were just like being tossed like rag dolls every which way. I got knocked up and I saw the flames shoot over top of my left, uh, the left side of uh, the cabin. All the overhead bins opened up, everything come flying out through the cabin. And we saw the fire and the uh, fireball come down first class section. And I could feel the heat and see the fire, but I never did get burned, it never got to me. Incredibly, 185 people, including Bill Mackin, the calls, and the captain, walked away from this fiery disaster. Sadly, 111 weren't so lucky. Just as important as careful design is proper maintenance of aircraft. Take the Aloha Airlines 737 descending for a landing at Honolulu in April of 1988. Suddenly, 18 feet of the top of the plane simply tore off. A flight attendant who was not in her seat was sucked out into the sky. But after an emergency landing, no other lives were lost. Design flaw and a maintenance disaster. Obviously, a design flaw, and what is really sad is other operators in the manufacturer had figured that out. There were actually kits available to go back and retrofit and, and, and check for those things. The problem turned out to be simple metal fatigue associated with the use of aluminum, which is unlike steel in one crucial respect, fatigue life. Aluminum does not have an infinite fatigue life. If I took a bar that it took 10,000 pounds to break and I started pulling on it at 2,000 pounds, after a while, it would go, snap, and I would have two pieces. Every time an aluminum passenger jet reaches altitude, it is pressurized inside like a balloon. When it descends, the pressure is released. If this process continues indefinitely without maintenance, sooner or later the balloon bursts. In airplanes, it becomes a concern around 30,000 to 50,000 takeoff and landing cycles. The first thing that happens is that cracks form in the skin. There were a couple people who actually saw the crack or they boarded and they just assumed, and I also assumed, that we could just trust that somebody had seen that and the government was doing its job. Then there's the case of TWA 800, which went down in the sea on its way from New York to Paris on July 17, 1996, taking all 230 lives. In the weeks and months after the crash, there was widespread speculation that the plane might have been brought down by a missile. The speculation reached such a fever pitch that the FBI commissioned the CIA to create this film explaining their version of events. They hoped to put to rest the missile theory once and for all. The FBI believes faulty wiring caused a spark in an empty fuel tank, igniting an explosion. The film was shown on television nationwide. Just after the aircraft exploded, it pitched up abruptly and climbed several thousand feet from its last recorded altitude of about 13,800 feet to a maximum altitude of about 17,000 feet. The FBI, as well as many in the industry, believe that two kinds of wire known to be trouble for some time may have failed and caused a spontaneous explosion on board. The wire, though still in use, is quietly being phased out. The United States military pulled it off their planes. The Navy pulled it off their planes. In fact, planes they couldn't get it off of, they grounded in the early 80s, mothballed them. 
They made sure it was not on Air Force One. But for the rest of us, the Federal Aviation's position is it is not a threat to safety. TWA Flight 800 went down in about 120 feet of water 10 miles off the coast of Long Island, New York. U.S. Navy divers spent four months and 4,000 dives to do what many thought was impossible. They raised 90% of the shattered airliner, a plane that weighed 350,000 pounds empty from the bottom of the ocean. The plane was reconstructed in a warehouse on shore. In the checkered history of the human race, the machine makers, the devisers of things, have brought mankind some of its most soaring moments of glory. Among those moments certainly was the sight of a human being leaving his, our, footprint on the surface of the moon. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. The Apollo program was NASA's response to President Kennedy's challenge. The program was designed to progress in stages. Apollo 1 was staffed with some of America's most experienced astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. On January 27, 1967, all three perished inside their training module on Earth when faulty wiring caused a spark in the oxygen-rich environment. Though technicians outside the capsule knew about the fire and worked frantically to free the trapped astronauts, it took five minutes to get the complex escape hatch open. By then it was too late for the three men inside. The disaster set the space program back over a year. Sixteen months later, in 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. This was an engineering triumph, perhaps beyond anything in history. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But on the heels of triumph, just one year later, disaster struck again. Apollo 13. Okay, here we had a problem here. Wonderful accident, so to speak, uh, turned out to be um, uh, absolutely stunning recovery from that. What was to be America's third landing on the moon ended in near disaster when astronauts heard and felt an explosion on board. A few small things that went wrong that normally wouldn't have made any difference and they came together in just a particular kind of way in that uh, ship. It turned out that two of the three fuel cells were destroyed and both oxygen tanks were losing pressure. Ground control and the crew figured out a way to use the lunar lander as a life raft and four days later they rounded the moon and returned safely to Earth. Two or three failures that interact in a way that nobody anticipated they would interact then they defeat the safety systems and bring the system down. Several small, unconnected engineering failures combined to cause this disaster. A heater thermostat supposed to be upgraded to accept 65 volts was overlooked and burned out above 28 volts. Several years before the flight, an oxygen tank had been dropped about two inches, further damaging the attached thermostat. When astronauts followed orders to stir the tanks, a routine procedure, the already damaged wiring melted, shorting out and causing a spark in an environment of pure oxygen. The resulting explosion blew the side of the spacecraft off. After Apollo 13, the astronauts said, we are trained all the time for the unexpected. They slam things to us in the simulator that just never would think about in order to prepare us for this. But if they had thrown those interactions that happened, that brought about Apollo 13 to us in the simulator, we would have walked off the program. We would have said, that's so far out. That could never happen. That 
same aerospace industry that could so inspire the people of Earth shattered our confidence and broke our hearts in an instant on January 28, 1986. Few who watched the Challenger disaster live will ever forget that moment as the magnificent ship exploded and dropped into the sea. In the weeks that followed, sorrow turned to rage as the true causes of the disaster became known. The immediate cause was a white-hot flame that burned through the side of a rocket motor. A puff of smoke is visible here as the burn-through begins. Only seconds later in the flight, the hot flare is clearly visible, burning through the side of the rocket motor. Like a blowtorch, the flare burned through the main fuel tank, igniting the liquid oxygen and hydrogen inside in a spectacular explosion. The flare had started at a joint in the rocket motor, a joint sealed with rubber O-rings. NASA and its contractors had evidence that the rocket motor O-rings could fail below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. But NASA had already launched shuttles below 53 degrees and gotten away with it. Just because you got lucky doesn't mean the risk is reduced. And sure enough, the risks were still there and the statistics caught up with them. On January 28, 1986, NASA decided to go ahead with a shuttle launch at only 36 degrees. There was solid ice all over the launch pad. Engineers involved with the O-rings did everything they could to stop the launch. On the fourth or fifth time, they pushed the envelope. Sure enough, almost exactly at you know the temperatures they said, those O-rings blew apart. And the tragedy of that is that besides the, the, the tragic souls lost on the Challenger themselves, there were people on the ground who warned about it, who were so upset about it, and who to this day are you know, destroyed because they, you know, knew about it, tried to warn, and they were dismissed. In recent years, there was another American space disaster. This one did not cause any loss of life, though it was a huge financial mess. And it was unusual in another way. It had a happy ending. The Hubble Space Telescope was a bitter disappointment to scientists from the day it was launched. But the Hubble was already in orbit before scientists discovered the main mirror was distorted, producing only about one-third the resolution it was designed for. Several things had gone wrong. One, the mirror had been ground to almost unthinkably close tolerances, but in the wrong shape. Because its own weight distorted its shape in the gravity on Earth. Once freed of gravity, the mirror sprung into a slightly different shape. Critics say it should have been tested for that. We have an axiom here. One test is worth a thousand expert opinions. And this is a classic example where no one could figure out a very elegant way to test it in zero G, so they didn't. NASA had two choices. They could abandon the hugely expensive project, or they could send a crew up to fix it. Astronaut Story Musgrave got the job. When he arrived in space, the Hubble was a mess. Putting in some new rate gyros, which had failed. I'm putting in the new wide field planetary camera, the deployable optics bench to correct for the spherical aberration, new magnetometers. Uh, the computer had lost half of its memory, we were replacing a coprocessor to get the memory back. All of uh, those kinds of tasks, if you added up the total amount of work uh, that we had to do, it came out to five days. At the end of it, the results were better than anyone had dared hope for. Since Story Musgrave's $50 million overhaul, the Hubble Space Telescope has looked farther into space than any instrument in history. A huge, costly engineering disaster that was fixed. According to a failure analysis study, the average American consumes so much energy every day it would take 200 slaves to reproduce his lifestyle. Modern industry makes such luxury possible, but the energy generators, chemical and manufacturing plants that create so much luxury can spread instant death when they fail. Since the first mushroom cloud lit the sky in the New Mexico desert in 1945, the world has never been the same. 34 years later, Three Mile Island, America's worst nuclear disaster. Three Mile Island had uh, four 
fairly trivial failures. All of them had uh, ways to recover from. None were that serious. But they all happened together. And that led the operators, following their instructions, doing just what they should have done, to zig when they should have zagged. That caused the accident. It began on March 28th, 1979, when a cooling pump failed at TMI reactor number two. The reactor automatically shut down as it was supposed to, but then a relief valve stuck open, venting radioactive steam out to the atmosphere, after which the operators made a crucial mistake. They stopped the flow of water to the radioactive core. The hot uranium core quickly boiled off the remaining water and then began to melt. Although operators followed their training, they weren't aware of the interaction of the group of failures that was occurring. But when the core dried up and began to melt down, operators realized their mistake and resumed the coolant flow. But the fuel was so hot by then, it shattered on contact with the cool water. By the end of the accident, about half of the core had melted down. Almost all the radiation was contained. There was no loss of life and no large-scale release of radiation, but the disaster effectively doomed the nuclear power industry in America. У нее нет ни запаха, ни цвета. У нее есть только голос. Вот он. Seven years later, April 26, 1986, the Ukraine is seen in this Russian documentary. Reactor number four at Chernobyl explodes and burns, pouring radioactive material into the atmosphere. 31 people die on the spot. Children were found to be most vulnerable. In the days after the explosion, a cloud of radioactivity that started out 200 times stronger than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs spread across Russia and Europe. Back at the site, firefighters facing certain death with superhuman courage put out the blaze and poured thousands of yards of concrete on the damaged building, trying to entomb it forever. Filmmaker Vladimir Shevchenko, who shot this incredible footage, was among those who died of radiation poisoning. As bad as Chernobyl was, it could have been much worse. If the wind had been blowing the other way, Chernobyl might have devastated the city of Kiev 80 miles to the south. Kiev's population is three and a quarter million. The explosions at Chernobyl occurred while an experiment was being run in the reactor. Incredibly, the experiment was conducted with the emergency water cooling system shut off. When the experiment went bad through a series of mistakes and miscalculations, a runaway reaction began. Out of control, the reaction shattered the fuel and eventually blew the roof off the building, exposing the core to the atmosphere. Chernobyl's Soviet-built reactor didn't have an immense, massive containment building like Three Mile Islands. Chernobyl was, was the, uh, the design disaster. I mean, first of all, the, the Soviets had much weaker and less safe designs for their nuclear power plants than even the, the U.S. Uh, manufacturers of nuclear power plants and coupled with a whole culture of secrecy, cover-up, bureaucratic flank covering, it was a recipe for disaster and it occurred. Nuclear power plants in the United States and Europe are designed and maintained to much higher standards than the ones at Chernobyl. But even so, could such an accident happen here? The NRC, back uh, about 15 years ago, I uh, thought that in the next 20 years, it'd be one meltdown all the way. It hasn't happened yet. When it happens, it'll happen, you know, without any alert. The worst industrial disaster in history didn't involve a nuclear reactor or a plane or a bridge. Bhopal, India. Late one night in December 1984, a Union Carbide pesticide plant based in Bhopal had an accident. It was right next to a large community. The community didn't have um, 
almost a roof over their head because it's just a shanty town. It was very open. Happened at night. Everybody was there. There was no warning for this uh, accident. And when the accident happened, the people in the plant ran the other way and didn't warn anybody. Somehow, 50,000 pounds of deadly methyl isocyanate gas escaped from the plant, spreading across the sleeping city of one million souls. Between two and 6,000 people died instantly, most in their beds. Thousands more died later or were blinded. Well, Powell was just very sloppy operation of the plant. Uh, first of all, it shouldn't have been positioned and sited in that area with huge population density. You know, you put that in a more remote area. But basically, it was uh, negligence uh, up and down the line in terms of the operation of the plant. The underground tanks holding the poison were triple the size of any other tanks in the world for the same poison. The tanks were overfilled. They were too hot. When water hit the poison through leaking valves, a runaway reaction occurred. The devices and systems designed to neutralize it were either not functioning or had been removed. The Indian government initially demanded $3 billion in damages and said they would prosecute Union Carbide executives for the world's worst industrial disaster. But by 1996, Union Carbide was paying a reduced settlement of $470 million and the executives had avoided criminal prosecution. At his core, the human animal is a builder. In all ages, among all races, that has always been true. Man's path out of the cave was littered with tools. But we have entered a new era in history. Our devices have grown in complexity to the point that we can no longer anticipate everything that could possibly go wrong. The more complex the system, the more likely an unforeseen interaction of small failures will cause a disaster. And this is to be feared. Because the genie that lives inside our most powerful machines, our nuclear reactors, our chemical plants, will kill us if it can escape. For the first time in history, engineers can wipe out whole cities by mistake. <laughs>